bus driver told Dad he'd have to sit or get off the bus. And Dad was a pretty strong young man. And he said, well, he wasn't going to sit or get off the bus unless the, unless the driver threw him off the bus. The driver sized him up, backed off. Dad stood the rest of the way to where he was going. Um, one thing I've been thinking about since he died is when we're alive, you know, we, 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 we walk around and we are uh, a lot, we're living, we're changing, we're moving, and, and around us is like a, a fog of stories that just, we, they're always changing and new ones are coming, and as soon as you die, all that's left are the stories, they're just these strands. In Dad's case, they kind of glow. And everybody who knew him has a different story because he had such an array of experience that there's, all my brothers will tell stories, we'll all tell stories of things that meant something to us. And um, so he had that breadth and richness to his experience that he shared with us. Um, last summer when I was home visiting, I sat in his office with him. He'd been there for a while trying to put batteries into a palm-sized tape recorder. He was fussing clumsily. And so I offered to put the batteries in for him. And while I did, he produced this cassette tape. And I put the tape recorder, I put the tape in the, in the little player. And it was opera without singing. And the first piece was Nessun Dorma which is a great Puccini love song. So while this beautiful music is playing, this scratchy, toy-sounding player, we both sit there and think of Mama, of course. And the music is so grand, but it's coming out of this little box. And Dad's bent forward at his waist, and he's happy, smiling. And he looks around him in his office, and there's all these pictures on the wall of his big life, you know, Dick Casey's big life, and the things he loved. So there's an aerial photo of the farm, taken in 1987. And he says, what's that? And I say, that's the farm. And I was living there then. And in fact, I remember exactly when the picture was taken. I was sitting in the front garden under this tree. And you can kind of see my legs get really close. <laughs> but I remember sitting out there, and I remember I was 31 years old, and I was terribly ambitious, and, and terribly, feeling terribly incapable. And Dad, and, and so, so I had that feeling of just the way I was and how scared I was, my ambition maybe. And, and then Dad points to another photo on the wall. It's our family sitting in a restaurant in the Chanticleer. I think it was up here. Uh, and that was taken about 50 years ago. Um, yeah. And uh, so they're looking at us. Mom and Dad are looking at us. And, and, and Dad looks at it and, and he says, um, Mom doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, ne and neither do I, he says. <laughs> so I say, and neither do I. Which makes him laugh when he looks at me. So the music goes on and on. I can barely keep from crying, it's so pretty. And he takes out a box out of his desk, and he opens it and shows me a ring. It's got three diamonds. I don't know whose ring it was. Maybe it was his mother's. Uh, but it's this diamond ring, he holds it up. And he laughs and he looks at it. And he says, he says, let's take it to mom. Let's give it to mom. And, uh, and, and then I said, well, she probably wouldn't like it on her finger, because she probably wouldn't. You know? And uh, then he points to another picture of himself in the courtroom. I think that was up there, too. Uh, he's making an argument. He's standing at a podium. And uh, his fist is a little above the podium. It's blurry. His fist is blurry. So I say, you're belting out an argument. Like to say, Bill, for 
melting on her argument. And he laughs, but he pauses thoughtfully for a long time. He looks at the picture. He says, I'm not pounding, I don't think. I think I was reaching for it. I think he was too. You know of our father's love of farming. His family's farming history in Maine. You know that from the obituary. This love of the land and animals never diminished in him. Dan thought of Wisconsin as the land of milk and honey, rich, fertile farmland, a society where folks with hard work could follow their dreams and become who they wanted to be in life. He arrived in Wisconsin from the East for law school in 1948, many months early. He needed work and a place to stay, so he went down to the unemployment office, as they were called in those days, and an immigrant farmer named Hans Breivy from Deerfield arrived at the office shortly after Dad did. He was looking for a farmhand. On the spot, Dad agreed to the job. The terms? Room and board, no pay. So by the next day, my dad was milking cows in Wisconsin, pitching hay, cleaning barn, and in heaven. He ate like a king. And he told us that Hans and Mrs. Bribey, long after they finished their meals, would sit and watch him eat spellbound. <laughs> As the weeks wore on, Hans would shake his head and say, Hates, I should have hired you for wages. It would have been a lot cheaper. <laughs> Dad worked for the Bribies milking cows before classes every day until winter set in and the roads became unreliable. At that point, he had to move to town. Years and years later, when Dad was in Washington engaged in the Watergate hearings, he took time off to return home to his family and his farm, to nurture his body and soul by making hay, making hay with the family on his farm in Spring Green. This is the same farm my father and mother purchased in 1967, heard about it in the obituary, the farm you've heard about, where Chris could ride a horse and the boys could learn to work so as not to fall subject to the dangers of lazy suburban life. Mom let Dad buy the farm, buy that farm, because she said it was pretty. So everybody was happy. <laughs> Dad bought an old-fashioned cattle truck, the kind with an enclosed back behind the cab. And during those early years, we rode to the farm from our home in Madison, about an hour's drive, in the cattle enclosure, sitting on tires, along with the tools and supplies needed for the day. We all worked on the farm together, and we loved it. The sweat, the camaraderie, the accomplishing of the tasks at hand, uh, the freedom, we were our own bosses. David and Rosalie managed the farm for nearly a decade, and started their young family there. And in 1989, Kim and I purchased a part of the farm, moved there, where we operated a grass-finished beef business. Dad was proud of us, all of us, for building a farm that works with the land. He believed in us and in the work. Well, I was 15 in that year of 1967 when he bought that farm. And at Christmas time, my dad gave me a, a gift of a book. It was the Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. This is Leopold's seminal work in which he fleshes out his fame land ethic. That land is to be loved is an extension of ethics. It's one of Leopold's lines. I read the book in its entirety before Christmas break was over, and that experience, along with my father's interpretation of Leopold's message and the significance of this message in a free society, set my life on a course from which I have never looked back. <coughs> Everything I feel about the land, land stewardship, I learned through a lifelong conversation I have held with my father about land, farms, and farming. 
When I was three years old, my father strapped some tiny skis on my feet and let me slide down the little hill on the golf course near our home. Once at the bottom, he simply tossed me over his shoulder like a sack and carried me back up. Three decades and thousands of downhill runs later, I was doing the same for my three kids. So skiing was the first love I learned from my father, and it's remained a lifelong passion for me and my family. But I tell you this because, for the purpose of this conversation, by the time I was a teenager, skiing meant long, long, snowy trips in the car, Colorado, Michigan's Upper Peninsula. First of all, with all the family, and then mostly just dad and me. And it was on these odysseys that our long, lifelong conversation about farming began to take root. I am farming essentially completely as a result of these conversations and the shared values with my father. And now, years later, I also get to teach and pass on these conversations to the next generations as an instructor at our wonderful agriculture college at our public university in Madison. Dad was my inspiration for farming in spades and my greatest advocate. But he certainly wasn't my mentor. Dad liked farming work. He liked farm work. It was his avocation, not his profession. He didn't craft his life around farm financial sustainability. So as Dad would request, I'd like to share just a little bit of some of his farming foibles. If there's ever a book published, it would, could be entitled Farming in the Fast Lane. Just kidding. And Dad would love this because these were his favorite stories, how he screwed up on the farm. And we have in the audience some of the folks from Kalsher Implement and Cross Plains who saved his butt a thousand times, sometimes more than once a day. And uh, we had a phrase on the Kate's farm that if Kalshers can fix it, then Kate's farm can break it. <laughs> Everything was a gizzy to my dad. Nothing had a technical name that someone else could interpret. It was a gizzy. And if the gizzy broke, we'd go to Kalshers. And I talked to Bruce Davy about this because uh, in the 70s and early 80s, uh, when the Cates boys were off to college and Dad was left to his own devices, uh, if you were a partner in Lawton and Cates, it also meant you were a farmhand on the Cates farm. Now, now, Bob the youngest was really good on the farm, and, and, but, but he had to also go in his turn away to college. And so that, of course, left Dad with his partners who uh, didn't know any more than he did. <laughs> so Bruce said every job that Dad did became three jobs <laughs> as a result of screw-ups and unintended consequences. And so I'll just give you one example. Uh, uh, Bruce Davey uh, reminded me that he spent one day with Jim Gardner, who may be here also, uh, as, as Bruce says, sorting cattle. Now, uh, <laughs> This meant they got to the farm and all the cattle, all the cattle were in the barn, and the barn hadn't been cleaned, so the manure was, well, you can imagine how high the manure was, and Bruce is telling me this story the other day. And uh, Dad says, our job, man, is to sort the big ones from the little ones. <laughs> so he says, so Jim Gardner and him are sorting the cattle, and, and he's got Bruce at the farm door, and edge the door out to the pasture. Bruce is standing there with a, with a heavy wooden pound. He says, Bruce, if a little one comes, you let it go by. If a big one comes, you just stand in front of it, and they'll see you, and they'll go aside. That's all you got to do. So Bruce is bucking around in the manure, and he's letting the little ones by, and Dad says, this is a big one, Bruce. Get in front of it which he does, and the animal ran right up over it. Comes back right into the muck, takes himself up, and he's looking at Dad, and Dad says, Bruce, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, we have a blind one. <laughs>
I, I'm nearly done, but I, I want to do what my brother Dave did. And just a acknowledgement for how he retained that sense of humor as he grew older. And just a couple years ago, our family was at a picnic. And now Dad has quite significant dementia. And we have to take him to the event. And he's sitting at a picnic table. And he's listening to one of the researchers at the university talk about our wonderful farm and how he's been up in the forest and worked with the oak savanna restoration and he's been over here planted he had a trial there for four years and he'd been over in this part of the farm and and he just loved our farm he'd been there seen the whole place and dad you know i'm not really sure he understands completely what he's hearing but uh, finally he says uh, he says uh, well, that's just Cracker Jack. <laughs> now, can you tell me, did you happen to find anything I may have lost? <laughs> <laughs> I love and miss your father, and always will hold you close. Oh. <laughs> I was the uh, Edgewater story was one that I was going to tell. Well, I'll have to say you told it much better than I could, and almost as good. <laughs> in 1965, when I was a second year law student, I was hired as a law clerk at Watson Case. And for the last 46 years, Dick Case has been my mentor, my inspiration, my fishing buddy, and my friend. Dick Case had a quality that I've never seen as great in any other human being. That is, he understood human nature. He understood people. And he understood why they did what they did. He understood their good points and their bad points. And I think this comes from a phrase you've heard somewhat already today. And that is, all human beings have value dignity and Dick said that many times to many juries. And they, these weren't empty words. He believed them and he lived them. And this huge outpouring that we have today is because Dick not only said those words, but he treated everybody he met with dignity and value and worth. And furthermore, he liked people. And because he liked people, people liked him. And that, I think, made him a lot of the man he was. His knowledge of human beings and who they are and why they do things as they were was probably inborn to some extent. But it was home in the orphanage, in the streets of New York, in the Marine Corps, the steel mills with every person he met. And with every person he met, he took something away. And that made him a tremendous lawyer. I can remember him cross-examining people. And in law school, we're taught, when you cross-examine a person, don't let them talk. Just make them say yes or no. Dick violated that with every person he cross-examined. He would make them talk. He'd ask them why. And then he would figure out where their weaknesses were as far as a particular case would come. And then he would zero in like a laser and make his point and move on. He wouldn't beat up the person. That wasn't his stuff. He would just make the point and move on. And I remember one time I was in court with him and he turned to me and he said, Jimmy, the only person. Jimmy. <laughs> he says, Jimmy, have I forgotten anything? And I said, Dick, how about this point? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he started asking the same questions. And I don't know, where are these questions coming from? And I put on his shoulder. Dick, no, no, this is why I said, I know. And after rambling for a while, he suddenly got to where he wanted and proved his point. He was trying to get evidence from the guy as to how he could cross-examine. And this knowledge of human 
of nature. I'm sure it served him well in Watergate, where he understood the reason immediately that there was an abuse of power, but also where he could find the evidence that would prove it. And with that, he then put together the case, many briefings to uh, the congressman, who was a key person in the final result in Watergate. And when he came back from Watergate, Dick did not want to be known. In fact, he didn't really want to talk about the whole world. He had been hired to do a job. He had done the job. He was proud of the job. He never wanted, he never did, commercialize his role in water. He did not want to make any problems in the world because that was even uh, his role. But he was a great lawyer. Had the ability, rational thinking, to put together a great direct case. Already told you about his, how he could cross examine. You saw him arguing to a jury. What would have been more fun would have been to see the jury he was arguing to. Because he had that way of all that they believed everything he had to say. You would see the jury lean up closer to hear what he had to say. They would hang on every word and word and word. <laughs> For two hours or more, they would hang on every word. <laughs> he would drive Judge Shabazz absolutely crazy, <laughs> but he would convince the jury. But he was, so he was a great trial lawyer. But he also told us that as lawyers, our first job is to be a problem solver. The people come to you with problems, and it's our job to solve them. And he was a great problem solver, partially because he was such a great trial lawyer, but also because he always treated everybody with dignity, values, and worth, and because he was such a rational human being. So when I look back at his legal career, all the time he spent them all together, there never was talk about dictates what he had done. It was stories that had come out of the people that he had lived his life with. And when I think of him and his, his legal career, I think he must be the would like to be thought of pure as, as a trial lawyer, but also as a person who can solve many problems. Now, unfortunately, his dramatic and electrifying life has now come to an end. But his, his legend lives on. 